So once again, chapter 3 for uh, Monday. And we're in the, the text itself, we won't be covering all of the chapters. We'll be kind of skipping around um, from this point on from, uh, in the semester. And the different issues that are addressed in the text are uh, related to curation. It's not a how-to, but things to think about as a curator. Um, because you do put yourself in the cultural, political, and economic sp spotlight by the very nature of what you do. And that's the reason I liked uh, Marstein so much. And there's another irony, because we talked about feminist curation uh, last week. Or was it the week before? Was it last week? And uh, I, think the, I, I think one of really, it's not only an irony, but it also makes perfect sense that most of the good books out there right now on curation are female authors. And, and I think it's really driving uh, the, the, the whole body of theory forward in a way that I think is much more organic, uh, much more open to change, and uh, I, I also say much more equal. Right, and the way that peoples around the world are being represented, and, uh, and particularly in the wake of colonization. So th this is why I like this text so much. And if you were to take my, uh, I think it's 455 class, uh, where we talk about, it's called actually Being Exhibited. Um, then we, we use another book by another curator um, uh, presenting what is valued. And her name is uh, Clavier. And the, I think these are two of the most important thinkers right now as far as curation goes in, in museum studies in the world, not just in the United States. Uh, another one uh, who I particularly li like uh, uh, deals with participatory curation. And if you take the uh, uh, museum education class, you would, you would encounter her work, Nina Simon. But today we're talking about the call for artists. And this is in the mindset that you are curating then for artists who are alive, because you can't call dead artists. And that's, uh, the way you're called dead artists is you'll be getting hold of other museums. That's a different process. So what we are going to do is we're going to kind of layer this on to um, what you're doing. It's not going to be part of your final project, but if you are going to do an extension to the final product, uh, project and you are going to extend it to the work of other artists, this is the process that you would go through to encourage other artists to submit their work to your five-piece uh, show. Is that, was that me or? I have an alarm and it sounds like that. Hold on just a second. Oh. So the call to artists is a release. It's like a press release or a letter or a notice that you are sending out uh, that lets artists know that this show is coming up. And then uh, you're encouraging them then to submit their work uh, to be possibly uh, juried into the show. What jurying means is that it's actually going to be evaluated by a person or several people to determine its uh, relevance as well as value, not monetarily, but how well it relates to the show's theme, as well as the excellence. So when you are uh, composing your uh, your call for artists. What you want to do when people are looking at this as artists is you want to give them a very brief paragraph that describes the theme or the themes around which that exhibit is going to be organized. There are several examples online that I strongly encourage you to look at after class to give you an idea of a way to order your call for artists because once again this is your uh, quiz two. So you want to have this brief paragraph that uh, describes a theme. Now you can invent a totally new theme for this quiz, or you can layer it on to the theme that you already have. So you don't have to reinvent something uh, necessarily. You can actually uh, act as if you were asking living artists uh, to participate in the exhibit that you're already designing for your semester project. 
you then want to have a description of the venue. Now, you'll find a lot of call for artists out there that were I an artist, I probably would not submit my work to them based on what I see as the call for artists because what they're putting up there is not complete enough. I like a lot of information. That reason being that I, I not only want to know about the gallery, I not only want to know about the show, I want to know who's curating it, I want to know who the jurors are. I really want a complete track record, and that includes of the gallery. So what you're putting up there when you are describing the venue, it's not just the gallery or the space name, but you want a brief description, a vision, or a mission statement for that, sp for that space. You've already got, for example, a vision statement um, in your semester project. Right, so that is, you, you could possibly co-opt that one. Um, you definitely want to have a street address. I mean, I've seen call for artists where they left off the contact information. And, and you're astounded not only that they released it, but also that whoever they gave the ad to released it without any of the contact information. So you want to make sure that you have not only the street address, but the phone, the email, as well as a website um, if the gallery has one, or for that matter, if you have one. I, you might remember on Monday, I encouraged you to develop your own website if you're going to go into curation, or your own blog, uh, or at least your own Facebook page. And uh, right along here, then you could have your Facebook page. And I was talking about the importance of social networking and getting people to come uh, not only to your space, but also in the call for artists, because people are starting to put call for artists on, on Facebook now. And, uh, or as well as a call for invitation. I just had to decline an invitation to um, visit the, the Gossin family. It hurt because I'm not going to be there. But it's a way to get people to come. Now, in that case, it's you know, to come to the booth. But it's also that people are using this now to solicit calls for art. Um, America Meredith, for example. Um, uh, about every three months, you'll get a call for art from America Meredith. Um, for stuff that she's curating. So uh, pay attention to this, this, uh, this electronic delivery. You want to have a brief curator bio or statement. All right, who you are as a curator, which includes not only your name, your professional experience, as well as a select uh, previous exhibition history. Now, for this class, you don't have an exhibition history yet. So make one up for the purposes of this class of, we'll say, two exhibits that you've curated before. And so, and, and that's just to get into that mindset of uh, the process and the information ne you need to inc uh, include. Because there are, um, particularly once you start to become more advanced in the curatorial world, that many artists are gonna pay attention to your track record as a curator too because they are making choices about where they're going to submit their work. And it comes down, you know, the same way you're looking at buying to a car. You're making choices and you want the one that you buy is going to be the one you stick with. You're, you're making a choice. And by sending your work to one show means that you are not sending it to another. So people want that kind of information because they are making decisions that affect the continuity of their career. So it's not just your career as a curator, but uh, you're also letting people know your track record uh, so that they can make an informed decision about whether their work is appropriate um, for the show you're presenting or whether their work is appropriate for you as the curator. You want to note the eligibility. In other words, what is the job description of the work that they are submitting as well as them as an artist? Because various... Uh, 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 shows might be open to everyone. Anyone can submit work, or it might be very restricted. And the kinds of restrictions you might encounter might be, are you a citizen of that country? And you'll often see international or national, or they're, they're, you know, anyone can apply. It's an international show. So not only citizenship, they might limit it to residents, that you have to live in Chicago in order to submit work to the show, or even live in a certain neighborhood when you get to smaller galleries. Um, they might limit it to ethnicity. Now ethnicity, um, I, and I, I use ethnicity over race because I don't believe in race as a concept myself. Um, race is an outmoded colonial term um, that, we are, that, we, that we have ethnicity, cultural affiliations. 
And so ethnicity might be that only, um, uh, only Navajo artists can submit or only Polish artists can submit. And so that's what I'm talking about, ethnicity. Um, it might be a show that's specifically women artists or specifically men artists or specifically transgender artists. And there's a lot of those kinds of shows that are starting to occur now. So it might be, I mean, that limited. It may even be age. You might only want kids. You might only want teenagers. You might only want people who are in their 90s. And so there, those are typical restrictions you might see um, as part of eligibility. And so think about, uh, as you are assembling um, this uh, call for artists, you know, what, what is the kind of person that you would like to have submit their work? 